fairy tale palaces, a dethroned king, and the mysterious circumstances of his death. All of that in this episode of Totally Awesome History, The Dark Side. King Ludwig II was king of Bavaria from 1864 to 1886, and until relatively recently was considered mad. A team of psychiatrists, however, led by Heinz Hafner, re-examined the case a few years ago and concluded that the diagnosis of Mad King Ludwig was an abuse of psychiatry for political purposes. Others have looked at the circumstances surrounding his death and found the official explanation of suicide wanting. Also known as the Fairy Tale King or the Swan King, Ludwig ascended the Bavarian throne at the age of 18. He was a pacifist and a dreamer, enamored by art, literature, and music. At one point during his reign, he even financed the composer Richard Wagner and the now famous Nibelung Ring operas. Growing up surrounded by stories and depictions of the Germanic past and Germanic legends, he had hoped to maintain the independence of the Bavarian kingdom he had inherited, and he believed in the absolute rule of kings in a time when monarchs throughout Europe were singing their swan songs. For this reason, he regarded the fact that Bavaria had become a vassal kingdom of Prussia in 1866 and then the Second German Empire in 1871 as the biggest failures of his kingship. And it was after this that he began to withdraw from public affairs. He also began to spend the majority of his time and money designing, building, and decorating the now famous and exceptionally elaborate castles of Linderoff, Neuschwanstein, and Herren Chimsey. <laughs> I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly there, but well, that's the best we can do. He even hired theatrical designers over architects to build them. In a way, the world he was trying to create with them was meant to represent the majesty and power of the great kings of old. Linderoff and Herren Chimsey were modeled after the summer palaces of Louis XIV and Versailles, the Sun King's main palace, respectively. So great did Ludwig II admire Louis XIV that he took to calling himself the Moon King, implying that he was a romantic shadow of Louis, the Sun King. Neuschwanstein was meant to represent a medieval knight's castle, though it incorporated romantic, gothic, and baroque architectural elements. Today, it is the most visited castle in Germany. When he wasn't building, he also liked to attend private and costly operas and plays. Like his father, he suffered at times from social phobia and occasional panic attacks. The presence of a large audience was therefore out of the question. Likewise, he was selective about the company he kept, even shunning dignitaries and other members of the royal family. But there were people he enjoyed spending time or corresponding with. One of these was Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor and iconic practitioner of real politic. From this rough sketch, we can see that Ludwig II was eccentric, prone to escapism, and was a benefactor of the arts. He was also said to be a homosexual, and in a time when homosexuality was considered a grave sin by the Roman Catholic Church. Though his hobbies were harmless, they did end up costing a lot of money. So much so that they brought the Bavarian state to the brink of financial ruin. He was issued a loan in 1884, but on the condition that he not incur any more debt. He also received financial help from Bismarck. Despite this, however, his debts climbed. So great was his debt that the royal house of Wittelsbach kept paying it until 2002. It was only on April 24, 1886, shortly before his death, that Ludwig finally realized this and issued an austerity edict instructing his court to radically reduce its expenses. But by that time, it was too late. You see, in the meantime, Ludwig's uncle, Prince Luitpold, the Prime Minister von Lutz, and the Minister of Royal House and Foreign Affairs, von Kralsheim, had begun plotting Ludwig's overthrow since late 1885. Most historians agree that this was done as a result of Ludwig's reckless spending and debts. 
Since the only way for Ludwig to be dethroned was if he was declared mentally unfit to rule, the conspirators found a psychiatrist with a dubious past who was willing to sign the papers, Dr. Bernhard von Guden, a friend of Prime Minister von Lutz. Without bothering to examine or even meet with Ludwig, von Guden based his diagnosis on the written testimonies of three members of the king's stable and personal staff, and two former cabinet secretaries Prince Luitpold had found for the task. He also neatly ignored all statements that spoke in the king's favor. The evidence that was cited for his madness included the following. His increasing reclusiveness and reluctance to deal with government ministers and his overall absence from public life, his homosexuality, or the rumors of it at least, his unusual powers of imagination, evidenced in some behaviors such as bowing to a statue of Marie Antoinette, or imagining that important people were present at his table when none were actually there. Of course, this was all in keeping with his personality. He had grown up in an environment surrounded by myth, legend, and fantasies of kingships of the past, and even as a youngster, lost himself in books and, according to his mother, enjoyed dressing up, took pleasure in play-acting, loved pictures and the like, and liked making presents of his property, money, and other possessions. The grandiosity of his castles was another reason that was cited as they were the most obvious outward manifestation of the fantasy world he had created for himself. And finally, and what really sealed the deal, was his excessive need for money. Based on the testimonies and these criteria, von Guden declared that Ludwig was 1. suffering from an advanced stage of paranoia, 2. that it was incurable, and would only worsen, and three, he would be incapable of exercising his power in government for the rest of his life. But as the team led by Heinz Hofner points out, none of the features von Guden lists in his psychiatric assessment as symptoms of King Ludwig's mental illness provided reliable evidence for such illness or for his lack of fitness to rule, although they had been specifically derived for this purpose from questionable sources. Even more, no sign of mental illness was present in terms of his administrative duties. These he carried out until the end, and was even admired for them by Bismarck, who, after Ludwig's death, said, Until his very end, I remained on good terms with him, exchanging letters quite frequently, and the impression I got of him every time was that of a ruler very much to the point in his dealings. The world is bound to essentially change its opinions about King Ludwig, when it is possible not only to admire his artistic creations, but also to study his correspondence as a statesman. Nevertheless, based on von Guden's diagnosis, the Bavarian Council of Ministers decided to dethrone King Ludwig on June the 9th, 1886. The next in line for the throne was Prince Otto, Ludwig's brother, who actually was insane. In light of this, surprise, surprise, Prince Luitpold was named Regent of Bavaria. He would remain the effective ruler of Bavaria until his death in 1912. The kingdom itself was dissolved in 1918 at the end of World War I. When they went to arrest him, Ludwig protested on the grounds that von Guden had never examined him, but regardless was taken away to Berg Castle on Lake Starnberg. There he was to be kept locked away indefinitely, guarded by male nurses and under the care of von Guden. Then, on June 13th, shortly after 6 p.m., Ludwig asked von Guden to join him for a walk along the lake. To this, von Guden agreed. The two were never seen alive again, and this is where the plot thickens. A few hours later, around 10.30 p.m., the bodies were found floating in waist-deep water. Von Guden had sustained blows to the head and neck, and some believe he was strangled, though nothing actually does prove this. There were also scratches on his face, and he had a broken fingernail. Ludwig was said to have no visible signs of injury other than a scrape on the knee. Officially, Ludwig's death was promptly ruled a suicide, 
The story being that as the two walked by the lakeside, Ludwig rushed into the lake, intent on drowning himself. Von Guden tried to stop him, and a struggle ensued. Ludwig, being the larger and stronger man at six foot four, managed to drown von Guden in the process and then proceeded to drown himself. Both bodies were then found a few hours later. Case closed. But there are some problems with that. First of all, Ludwig was considered a good swimmer, so it would have been quite difficult to intentionally drown himself, especially in water that was only waist deep. What's more, in Ludwig's autopsy, there was no water found in his lungs. Likewise, when both bodies were found, they were floating, indicating that there was no water in von Guden's lungs, either. When a person is drowned and water fills their lungs, they sink. Only later do the gases remaining in the body cause it to rise. Since their bodies were found a mere few hours later, after they had disappeared, it is highly unlikely this would have occurred in such a short time. And while there is such a thing as a dry drowning, where someone takes in a small amount of water in their nose or mouth, which then causes their airways to spasm and close up, as drownings go, it is exceptionally rare. That there would have been two of these simultaneously makes the probability drop to low single digits. But there's more. A diary written by Jacob Little, the king's personal fisherman, who was also involved with the search for the bodies, was found after his death in 1933. In it, he said, Three years after the king's death, I was made to swear an oath that I would never say certain things, not to my wife, not on my deathbed, and not to any priest. The state has undertaken to look after my family if anything should happen to me in either peacetime or war. What this referred to was what he saw that day. He claims that he was hiding behind some bushes in a boat, waiting for the king. The plan was that he would rendezvous with the king and then take him to meet some other loyalists who would then help the king escape. This is what happened next in his own words. As the king stepped up to his boat and put one foot on it, a shot rang out from the bank, apparently killing him on the spot, for the king fell across the bow of the boat. Handwriting analysis confirms that the words written in the diary were indeed written by Little. There is also the discovery by art historian, expert in 19th century paintings, and professor Siegfried Wichmann. In 1967, a sketch was presented to him with three faces on it, as well as evidence of raindrops on it. He confirmed that it was done by a painter named Hermann Kalbach. One of the faces depicted an older gentleman, with a look of shock as he looked toward the face in the middle. The middle face belonged to a man apparently dead, with blood issuing from his mouth. The third also facing the middle figure, bore a tear running down his face. On the back of the canvas, three names were written, S. von Leuenfeld, Ludwig II, and Hornig. The presence of blood on the sketch of Ludwig indicates that he was not, in fact, drowned. One of the other figures was Maximilian Schleiss von Leuenfeld, the king's personal physician. According to his own autobiographic notes, von Leuenfeld had publicly doubted von Guden's diagnosis, but had received death threats from the conspirators who made him renounce his remarks. In 1982, von Leuenfeld's estate went up for auction. It contained old books, letters, and paintings, and the competition was stiff, including, as it did, the king's family. Nonetheless, Wickman secured the items. And in one old book, he found a handwritten note in an abbreviated old German handwriting style. It described what von Leuenfeld had seen that day. Believing that the king was in danger, von Leuenfeld set out with the painter Hermann Kalbach and two brothers named Hornig to see the king at Burg Castle. When they arrived, they sensed something was wrong. They discovered the king, dead shot in the back. 
Von Guden was 20 meters away from the water, trying to change the king's clothes and staunch the wound. Realizing he had been discovered, he rushed at the four with a syringe, but the brothers Hornig strangled him in the ensuing fight. Kalbach immediately began sketching the visage of the king. As it started to rain, they carried the body to a nearby fisherman's hut, where he completed the sketch. The hut was torn down a few days later, and the four contrived an official story as to how von Guden had wound up dead. Kalbach sketched von Lohenfeld and Hornig later at home. Presumably, at some point, the bodies were moved to the water. Finally, in 2007, a 60-year-old Munich banker called Detlev Uttermol swore in an affidavit that when he was 10, he and his mother were invited for afternoon coffee and cakes by Countess Josephine von Urba Kaunitz, who looked after some of the Wittelsbach family's assets. He recalled how the Countess gathered everyone together and told them in hushed tones, now you will find out the truth about Ludwig's death, without his family knowing. I will show you the coat he wore on the day he died. Then she opened a chest and pulled out a grey loden coat with two bullet holes in the back. Mr. Utermo further declared that his mother had left him a note before she died, affirming what they saw that day. Unfortunately, the king's coat was lost after a fire at Countess Werbe Kaunitz's home in 1973, in which both she and her husband perished. Of course, the Wittelsbach family has dismissed all claims of murder, but they have also refused all requests at an exhumation or a re-examination of Ludwig's body of any sort. And there are other pieces of circumstantial evidence, such as an alleged note by Rudolf Mag, the physician who examined the dead king before he was transported to Munich for his autopsy. In it, he claimed that the report he made was untrue, and that the Bavarian ministry had ordered him to keep quiet about the bullet entry wounds in the king's back. Of course, this note has not been found. All of this, however, is a rabbit hole one can go down quite some ways. If the king was shot, and the accounts we have are true, it does beg the question, who pulled the trigger? If it was von Guden, then why didn't von Lohenfeld mention the presence of a gun? And was von Guden in on it? Obviously he must have had a change of clothes for the king to hide the bullet wounds, and why had he rushed von Lohenfeld and his companions when they arrived if he wasn't part of the conspiracy? And why does the Wittelsbach family insist that no re-examination of Ludwig's body be conducted to settle the matter once and for all? In the meantime, perhaps shining some light on the last days of King Ludwig will in some way bring justice to his memory. He was once quoted as saying, I wish to remain an eternal enigma to myself and to others. In a way, he got his wish. And that's why his story is part of Totally Awesome History, and why the plotting against him and the possible assassination of him belongs on the dark side. Hey everyone, if you like this, please do like, share, and subscribe. It always helps so much when you do. Also, join us on social media, either Facebook or Twitter. And if you do feel so inclined, leave a tip in the tip jar or become a patron on Patreon. Until next time.